Ladies and gentlemen, we are finally ready to, well, move into a world or side of transistors that has not as much to do with logic gates. Of course, up to this point, all we've been doing is replicating basic logic gate behavior. But now, we can start to move beyond. And we're going to start with this very intimidating sounding thing called a bistable multivibrator. Let's just take a look at what it does. Hello and welcome back to Transistors. So, what is this thing that has such a scary, intimidating name? Before we go into this, let's actually take a quick detour back to logic gates. Now, you remember we looked at this thing called a latch, in particular this one, which is the most basic RS NOR latch. The idea is by laying out our two logic gates, namely our NOR gates in this manner, it is actually able to hold one bit of data. When you toggle one of these inputs, the internal state changes and it actually latches to that value. What that means is, well, you know, even if your input goes back down to low, that value remains stored. So that is a pretty cool, I would say almost a side effect of having our logic gates hooked up in this manner. Notice of course that what we're doing here is we're actually allowing the lines to cross. And when they cross, an output value is actually fed back to the other gate as an input value. And this is what allows the state to actually be stable and be latched on as it is. A bistable multivibrator is the same idea, except now we are using transistors to do it. In fact, we only need two transistors. And conceptually, it's very much similar to our RS knowledge, except of course, we don't have to implement two NOR gates. Let's take a look at how this actually works. This, ladies and gentlemen, is our bistable multivibrator. I mean, wow, it's a lot to take in. So what we're going to do is we're going to just sort of simplify things a little bit first by taking out some of the complexity. Now, ignoring that gigantic crossed thing in the center, really, all there is here are just two sets of NPN transistors. One on the left, one on the right, like so. One point to note is that they are flipped horizontally, right? So yeah, the output side of both have an LED sitting there. As you can imagine for each of these, if we were to actually, you know, raise the base to high, the LED comes on. If it's low, the LED goes off. So with that part out of the way, we can now make our first of two connections. And that is to actually move this wire across so that it connects the base of our left transistor to the collector of our right transistor. With just this one connection, let's see what it entails. First, let's start by setting this base to low. Of course, what this means is, this is like a switch that is open, right? There is no connection between our collector and our emitter. In this case, since there is sort of no complete circuit for our LED, it will of course be off. Again, because there is no connection, this line would technically have been floating, if not for the fact that we have our pull-up resistor over here, which then pulls this line high. Now, this line is also the base of our left transistor, and since this is high, there is a complete circuit over here, our LED will light up. So yeah, because of this connection, when this base is low, well, this LED is on, this LED is off. Of course, as you can imagine, the converse is true when the input goes high. When it is high, the low state from here is able to flow on through to this side. Because there is movement of charge across the LED, it lights up. At the same time, as a result of this, this line goes low. Right, we override the pull-up resistor. As a result of this, our transistor here acts like a switch that is open. Therefore, your LED here is off. Nothing too out of the ordinary, I hope. Let's go ahead and amp up the difficulty of this setup even more by actually going ahead with our second connection. Now, the two bases are cross-connected to the two collectors. And let's see what sort of effect this creates. Because we need to start somewhere, 
Let's assume that we have an on state over here at this LED, as in this LED is lit up. What that means of course is that since this is on, there must be a flow of current through here, therefore the yellow wire here is low. Of course naturally the base of our left transistor must be low as well, and what that means is that LED here is off. Since this transistor here is acting like an open switch, essentially the entire green line is disconnected. Thankfully, we have a pull-up resistor here, which pulls the whole green line up to high. And there is one important conclusion we can draw from this. The high state here is consistent and okay at the base here, right? Remember, high implies that this switch here is closed, right? And that is indeed what is happening. All these states will remain as they are. Or to use another word, it is stable. Now, don't forget, our setup here isn't actually complete. In fact, we need to introduce one more thing, and that would be the switch. Now, for this to work, we'll also need to add a resistor here. And in fact, these switches are here for us to change the state of the circuit. In fact, let's see what happens when we close the switch. Now, previously, the yellow line was low. However, now, when we close the switch, we force a high state true. Here is what happens. All our old states become invalidated. Instead, let's start tracing again, knowing now that it is high here. Since we actually close this switch now, of course, this LED comes on. The low state comes through, and as a result, the base here is low. This breaks the circuit here, causing this LED to go off. This section of wire here in blue is now basically disconnected. It uses the pull-up resistor here to go high, right? It is pulled high by the resistor. So as long as the switch is closed, all is well. But what happens now when we reopen the switch? The yellow segment of wire now goes disconnected. It is essentially no longer driven by this high source. However, thanks to the fact that this segment of wire is being pulled high, our yellow wire remains in the high state. That's right, it's actually being pulled back up to high, and again, our entire circuit is stable. This base was high, now when this is open, the base is still high, and what this means is, well, we retain the current state. Everything is stable, everything is latched on as it is. Now, let's introduce our final switch and see how things change up. Again, our state hasn't changed from the previous slide. Let us now close this switch, causing this green line to go up to high. Of course, this causes this LED here to come on. The low state flows on through to this blue line, which in turn knocks this base down to low. That opens the circuit, switching off the LED. Again, when we open up this switch, our state remains stable because again, our green line here is being pulled high by this resistor. So yeah, there you go. This is essentially your bistable multivibrator. The idea is you can put it in a state by setting that particular base high. Even when you disconnect the state, it is able to hold itself stable. And as a result, what we've created here is a very simple storage mechanism. Whenever we flip any one of these switches, they will cause the state of this entire circuit to change. And it will remain that way until we tell it to change again. That is the power behind this setup. So I think we've gotten enough theory here. After all this talk, we can finally see our bistable multivibrator in action. Now, our two NPN transistors are right here. And of course, we have our couple of resistors acting as pull resistors. And yeah, basically these two lines are going to be our switches. Now, I opted to not use a switch, you know, an actual push button for this setup so as to keep things simple, but of course you can. Instead of doing that, I just have this jumper wire that's going to, you know, our plus rail, our high state. And all I have to do is to actually poke this on the relevant line and look at that. I'm just passing the state back and forth between our two LEDs, like so. And again, all I need to do is to just touch it once, 
the state goes over and it latches. It stays as it is. And that of course is where the name bistable comes from. It's able to just jump to your other state. It is stable in that state, so the state remains. And yeah, I can always, you know, just go from one side to the other. Now, just as an interesting point, remember how I said that we had to assume that one of the states were true? That is the very interesting part about this setup, because the starting state is actually not no. Now, take a look at this. This is my incoming power, so if I were to pull it off, the whole setup just switches off. I'm going to just connect the power back again and watch what happens. When I first start up this system, this light comes up first. Except, does it really? Let's try that again. I'm going to pull that out and reconnect it. It's still this light. I'm going to try it a couple of times and see, in fact, on the third try, the LED that comes on is the other one. Interestingly, if I were to try this enough times, you will see that you know, which LED starts off lit is random. Of course, really physically speaking, it's not random. It's just, you know, whichever state latches on first, right? That will be the site that starts off high. But we have actually no idea which site that is. Of course, we can make this consistent, right? All we need to do is to actually start it off with one of the switches pressed, so to speak. For example, if I were to start off with this switch pressed, well then, we can be sure that its side is going to be the side that is high. So there is a way to make this consistent as long as you know we keep one of the switches pressed down to start off with. Of course, we can then go ahead and flip this over, and yeah, our system will work as you expect. So the key property here is that the moment a state is set, it stays. It stays that way until we actually change it until we actually tip the balance by flipping one of the switches. And that is why we call this by stable. Of course, just as an interesting additional note, right, while everything works fine and dandy as long as, you know, just one side is high, we can sort of confuse the system by making both sides high. For example, if I were to just attach an additional wire here that will sort of mirror the high state over to the other input, you will see that both outputs come on. This is basically an invalid state. So yeah, one important point to note is that only one input can be high at a time, if any. So yeah, that would be your bistable multi-vibrator with just two MPN transistors. And there you have it. Despite its extremely you know, complex sounding name, it really isn't a very difficult circuit to understand. All you need to know is that the value is being sort of latched on, right? It's actually stable in a current state, and that's why it just retains its state until you change it. And what this means, of course, is that what we've just done is we've used our transistors to implement a very small unit of storage. We have truly come a very long way. From the very beginning, where we've only treated a transistor as a switch, we have now gone on to implement first logic and now memory. Again, this series is almost at its close, but I do want to visit a few other things in the coming episodes, and we'll sort of see where this takes us. But that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.